Live. I like this room. We're telling everybody you're on live, yes. All right. Do you know, thanks We've got a couple time. people in here. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Sorry I'm late. I was supposed to go on at 4, and when I checked the time, they told me it was 5. So here we are, live from uh, Monitor Fest 3, 2024. Got a great lineup. Uh, we're going to do a couple interviews here on the porch, me and Brian. And uh, hey, how y'all doing? Uh, hey, Brandon, how y'all doing? Do me a favor. I'm sorry if I'm not going to like acknowledge you guys. I'm trying to get these interviews going uh, we got some big stuff and we're live from uh monitor fest 2024 you can kind of see the parties over there brian's out building my daughter sarah right here brian Duraka, the man of the hour he's coming up for an interview in a minute we're waiting for uh brian waterloo to come out of the house so yep it's a beautiful beautiful day hey brad you're up next so um yeah, it's a beautiful day, and we're going to be doing some interviews here. Uh, bear with me, everybody. Canadian Cold Blood, what's up, my man? Uh, got some coming eye for you this year, brother. Some good ones, too. Hey, there's my uh, granddaughter. How you doing, Gabby? Hi, Gabby. Yeah, so we're doing these uh, interviews live from Monitor Fest here. Uh, again, I'm just waiting for... Brian to come out. So while while I'm waiting for Brian to come out, I'm gonna hand the phone to my daughter so we could, you know, kind of do some talking and stuff. <laughs> are you are you still running that thing? Yeah. Okay. So until Brian gets here, um, uh, how y'all doing? Of course, Mike Stefani, Mike's monitors here. We're sitting with Brian Duraka. Who um, uh, is just absolutely crushing the game right now? Um, he has just produced. Correct me if I'm wrong. World's first Dorianus. As far as I know. It's world's course, first. At well, least the U.S. first. Yep. That I have heard. Well, we're gonna just call it that of what it is. So, big, huge congratulations with that. Thanks. You know, we've been in this game a long, long time, and we've seen many Dorianus just come and go wild caught imports nothing ever and you're the man you 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 crack the code you got uh you just hatched out two i believe and then the rest of that clutch yep. are pipped what what is the number four four extra uh four pipping now and just two so it'll be six total and they're really large babies yeah they're pretty Pretty yeah. decent. Yep. About yeah. the size of a baby lace or Molinas. Right. And they, they seem to have, uh, here we go, man of the hour. He's here now. We're back with Brian Waterloo, host of the show. Hello. Sorry. So, what we're, 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 we're going to bring up the speed real quick. We were just talking with uh, Brian. His major about, achievements? Absolutely. And I asked him about, uh, you know, the size of the hatchings that look really large. So, from there, my next question is, uh, they picked on their own, and they, when they came out of their eggs, they seem to have used completely the yolk set because they're really nice sized babies. Yeah, yeah. Explain that. Yeah, then they they used everything up. There was uh, just a tiny bit of uh, uh, yeah, just a I mean, teeny tiny bit of uh, fleshy stuff that actually ended up coming off my hand on the first one. Uh, the second one so far had nothing. Uh, I guess I'll find out what the rest of them, but <clears throat> yeah, they, it was about a day and a half and they're out. So, so let me ask you this. I can only imagine the, uh, the, the awesome feeling when you first found this clutch of eggs. Then you had the long, what, 200 plus 200 day? days? Yeah. 200 day incubation, and then when you went to your facility and you open up that incubator and you see them noses, you got to tell me how that felt. Uh, it was pretty amazing. It, uh, I think I just said finally, you know, uh, it, 
I hit about 155 days, which seems to be around the uh, typical Indicus time period. And so... This is in yeah. line with, like, the Malibus hatch. Correct. And, uh... So I've been waiting, you know, it was 45 days. I mean, I was about to cut them open myself and see what's going on, but uh, I, I just waited and waited and waited and, and definitely was running out of patience. So when, I, when it finally happened, it was a great relief. And definitely I was telling people about it right away and just, oh my gosh, it, it finally happened, you know. So I post on Instagram. Now this is pretty quick. Your eighth species of monitor do you produce? Uh, something like that. I'd have to count that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good work. Also with the balloonists. And uh, Brian's being a little humble, man. Because when we were over there at the party and we were talking, you told me what really happened when you'd seen them noses come out. <laughs> you were yelling and screaming. Yeah, well, yeah, I was uh, definitely excited. I was definitely really excited. Um, I would say, like, finding the clutch of eggs is probably probably more exciting because it's the first that you know everybody else I talked to hadn't got any good eggs yet and this was as I told you it was the third clutch and finally they were good um, so I, I I think I called Brian right away and just like I did it finally you know so that was it and obviously having them actually hatch is even better, but I was just expect at that point I was expecting it, and it was, you know, and, you know yeah. I mean, it was overwhelmed, you know. Still to think, now you have some. What's the word I want to say? More clutches behind me. Yeah, I have one more clutch, um, and I have. Uh, she's probably going to lay another clutch in the next week or two. So it sounds to me like uh, they agree. I'm sure. Dorianus in the United States seemed at this point pretty, pretty solid captive boards. He's got a lot to work with. Oh yeah, he's yeah. the first one he's done. Yep. Yeah. Which is great for us here in the United States. Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, it's been a uh, major achievement. All he needs to do now is get some uh, tripods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. That's next. That's my, uh, one of my holy, out over here? holy grail. We'll get you in a minute. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, hopefully this year I'll get some fun Yeah, yeah. I'm all for it. I'm sure you could do a little trading. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Yep, we'll see. So again, here we are live, Monitor Fest uh, 3, 2024. And we were just speaking with Brian Duraka, who just pulled off the world's first as far as I'm concerned, unless somebody can prove me wrong. And then it would be limited to the United States, but I'm pretty sure it's a worldwide thing. Yep. So, big congratulations. Yep. Thank you for thank doing you. this interview, my man. No, thank you. Real, uh, Thanks again. Real happy for you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, next, we're going to bring in the beautiful Adeline Robinson Filmeyer. Oh, shucks. Who does, uh, she donates her time to do the artwork for Monitor Fest. And, and if you know anything about artwork and the modern world, you know Adeline is the best. So, I'm so honored. Oh, you. yeah. Hey, you gotta, you gotta be careful with those fingernails, and you might land a helicopter on your finger. Yeah. <laughs> Get the neon going. So, so uh, nice to have you here, as, as, you're, always, as you're always here. Me. And uh, go ahead, take it away. All right. Um, I'm Adeline. As uh, you just heard that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, so I do primarily Copic and acrylic painting illustrations of reptiles, amphibians, and any kind of critters that basically don't get the love and attention and um, airtime as much as like a lot of the, the fuzzy cool critters that are, you know, lions and tigers and whatnot. Yeah, so. yeah, okay. As long as you're going that, that <laughs> way, I'm okay. I thought you were start talking about amphibians and gerbils and stuff. <laughs> You know, those kind of fuzzy animals. No, but, you look um, at wildlife part. It, there's, you know, you always see a lot of cool, like, lions, tigers, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You don't see a whole lot of cool reptiles. No. no. And, and, of course, uh, your style, I don't know, is there a style to that? Or is it your own style? Like, so with I, the dots? I, and, you I know? try for photorealism okay. as closely as I can. So I, I typically um, say it's high detail realism. I get as closely as I can to try to get it as, as photo perfect. Amazing. So. 
I, I really enjoy getting the, the crisp scales and making sure everything's anatomically correct. So to get the facial scales in the right spot, you know, make sure that the, the structures of the animals are, are correct is my, my big thing. You do a great job. I wish you ever think about picking up a tattoo gun. It would be super cool. I, I would have to apprentice, so it would take it would take quite a quite a while. But I, I, I don't know how it would transfer. That skill would transfer to tattooing, you know what I mean? Maybe it would be an easy pickup. Um, I am friends with quite a few tattoo artists that absolutely knock it out of the park. So if anybody's looking for full reptile tattoos, I can definitely send some great recommendations. Great. Um, it isn't really anything that I've ever, like, I've considered it. Like, it would be cool, but I really enjoy hands-on working with traditional mediums and, and doing my paintings. And, and I can remember all those years of watching you, like, time-lapse yeah. on, uh, you know, doing your work. And, it's just amazing. I, I, I'm i weird, man. So I can sit there and watch you doing that tedious work for hours. I don't know why. And also there's a guy, Jada Barber. Don't ask me why the guy cuts hair on video. Oh, yeah, those and, are satisfying. Yeah, and I can just watch it. Those look satisfying not, videos. You know, after like 20 minutes, I'm like, I'm watching hair cut. What am I doing? It's not like your... Carpet cleaning? I don't do Yeah, but that is the pretty cool. Washing. Yeah, putting these things. Yeah, that is cool. There's so many books. But, uh, so, again, Brian and I both want to thank you for... Well, yeah, no, I want to yeah. kind of get into how, you know, you've done this badge for this year. This was the second year. The original one I didn't have on me, but, um, you know, it was kind of interesting how I, you know, I'm like, hey, I really want you to do the badges, do the banner, and, you know, you ask for a couple ideas and then yeah. create these awesome pieces of work and it's I don't know, kinda like I know last year with uh, mice coming eye and then one of my lace yeah. um we gave you what was it a five or six big picture of each. Yeah. And it, it came out perfect. And then again this year too. Well it's fun for me is seeing the difference between the two of them because I try to get more detail mm -hmm. in this year's a little bit too. So you can kind of see their you know Absolutely. see the progression a little bit. But they're so much fun to work on. I mean it there's so many monitors out there to be able to draw and paint and, and do that. And, and again, you, I mean, if you look at the head structure of that Parenti and then the head structure of the Salvadora, she nails it. She nails it every time the big bulbous snout of the crack, mm -hmm. the pointy of the Parenti, and I mean, just um, it's amazing. So. Yeah. But yeah, it wouldn't be Monitor Fest without you and your art. Absolutely. Well, thank, you guys, thank you for putting it on. Yes. Thank you guys for all you do for the, you know, for the community when it comes to teaching and sharing information and being able to network with everybody, it's it's so much fun. It's awesome to be able to talk different ideas with enclosures and feeding and breeding. It's it's, it's a really good time. Which is a, you know, again, the whole kind of the whole point of Monitor Fest was originally just getting monitor people together because we're all scattered or. You know, we don't have the time to talk to each other at shows. shows. Like, just, I don't get to see anybody. Yeah. So it's nice to actually be able to sit down and chat. Yeah. And then try to talk to Adeline at a show. She's either working or there's a million <laughs> people around her. So this is really nice that we can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one with you. And, uh, you know, Brian extends his appreciation. And as we all do, I mean, it's on everything. So, um, and if you ever want any of the coolest artwork, Literally in the industry, you can look at them all. There's a lot of good artists out there. I'm not bashing anybody, but she takes to another level. Adeline Robinson, Bill Meyer, art. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, and it, so while we got you here and you're a beautiful face, can you say something about US art? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Without US art, we wouldn't have the community that we do. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do shows. The zoo industry would be impacted. Like, there's, there's so many aspects of the animal industry that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for their hard work making sure that they protect our rights as animal keepers and custodians. You know, it's it's absolutely insane some of the bills that they're trying to pass. I remember it was a couple of years ago, uh, banning in, like any transportation of any exotic animals within Illinois. And it's like, what are zoos supposed to do? What are, you know, veterinarians supposed to do? What are you supposed to do if you're going to Tennessee and you got to go from Illinois, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, that's actually would be a legality problem. And it's, it's, it's just crazy what people are trying to get past through. So USARC is incredible in being able to literally needle in a haystack all of these bills and, and be able to protect like you were saying, the rights of keepers. You know, we don't often hear, you know, 
often get involved in politics till we get older in life, but just to see how these sneaky SOBs, you know, they're putting in a Homeland Security package where, you know, you're legitimately concerned with Homeland Security, and when you read these 400-page bills and there's something like interstate transfer of animals, yeah. it's like, what does that got to do with Homeland Security? But that's how sneaky they are. That's why the U.S. Art is so important. Guys like uh, Phil Goss, who tirelessly works and, you know, has I don't know how he does it. It is amazing. I, I guess um, they got some kind of a computer program that picks yeah, up on scams. keywords. Yeah. So, but again, you need so eyeballs watching it. He's that. there and he's going to all these, to all these, you know, meetings and yep. it's just insane. Tireless, man. Tireless. Yeah, guy. weekend after weekend. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy. So I, I do everything I can to be able to try to give back as much as possible. Absolutely. So. I know Brian, he's a big supporter of US Art, me and, and Adeline. And it's very simple to uh, to join US Art. There's low memberships, like I believe five bucks. And, yeah. And then you yeah. can go up to tiers to a higher uh, tier and give more. But even if you don't join, at least uh, plug into their website and you know follow all the bills and the things, the laws that they pick up and fight up against. Uh, and they're, there's they're, power in numbers, so we sure. need we need registration. They're also look, you know, always looking for volunteers at shows if someone can't necessarily do a membership. Volunteering helps, you know, being able to bid on things at the auctions, every little bit counts. Yep. Donations and so on. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you very much, Adeline. And uh, that's we have Adeline Robinson, Bill Meyer, <laughs> Art. <laughs> Look her up on Instagram. You're on everything. Uh, yeah, pretty much all the time. She's on everything. <laughs> so just join in and uh, join US Art for Fight. Thank you very much, Adeline. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you, Brad. You introduce him. All right, so next up, uh, Brad from Brad's Bioactive, who's uh, got some cool stuff going on with all his uh, cages and work with the monitors he's got for Mike, and come on in, Brad. Have a seat. All right. So, Mike. Hey, what's up, bro? Brian. Brad. Brad. So, what's, uh, what's new with Brad? Brad's bioactive. Oh, really just trying to build the next enclosure, trying to push the limits of housemen tree. A uh, great mentor here, Mike. I mean, he showed me a lot of things over the years as far as you know, working with the epoxy, um, enclosure size, really bringing the natural beauty not only of the animal, but of the enclosure and the environment that it lives in. And really be able to one, display the animal for, for what they're worth. Absolutely. So uh, what I always try to say, is Brian's an old dog like me, we've been around a long time, and we've never done the lowest common, den common denominator type enclosures that are just good enough the husbandry is all there and, and you know you get positive results but you're looking at you know wire and, and you know whatever clay pots just the old-fashioned way of doing things we and brian have been doing this a long time we've always went for naturalistic enclosures so for as long as we've been doing that to to see back when it was just like kingsnake.com early days of the computer mm -hmm. we used to just gawk at the Europeans and how they do naturalistic enclosures and Brian and I have always done that so we've always been able to relate more with the European style of husbandry in not only meeting first and foremost you got to meet all their husbandry needs uh, secondly you replicate a habitat for them to the best of your ability and what, what I've always said it does is it keeps you locked in and interested in looking at your animals, interacting with their habitat. Then, when you got your neighbor comes over or somebody comes over and they see your stuff and they're just blown away. So, for us to see this finally starting to come full circle and really catching on here in the United States, you know, we're, we're fat in the United States. We're fat, so we want a bunch of stuff. But if you have a bunch of stuff, you're, you're cutting into the husbandry aspect of it and the beauty of it. So if you cut back your collection a little bit, do better naturalistic enclosures, and, um, and then from there, uh, 
you know, you have less animals to work with, more time to enjoy them. People, you blow their minds away, and when they come and they see your stuff, and then they give you a call and they say, hey, what was that stuff? That's basically what happened with me and, me and uh, um, Brad here. So, obviously, Brian and Brad are both very, very artistic when it comes to habitat design and uh, aesthetics. So when when uh, when I see it catching on and I see you, just you're the man. You are the man right now. You, you're you're meticulous with your work, so detailed, and you present it well on on Facebook. I mean, dude, you 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 are an asset, big time to this community. So now that I'm done babbling my brains out, take it away, guys. So Brett, how do you? Uh, I guess how do you look at your design when you start? You know, figuring out your layout. Like I always, you always have something in mind. Like I want to have it a certain look, like this. I want this ledge here. I want to make sure this is here. We're going to have the basking light, so on and so forth. So, kind of take me through like your, I guess, typical. Kind of going to do this new cage. So this is like the first steps that I'm looking to do before I even touch a piece of material. Yeah, sure. And I mean, you can definitely see exactly what you're talking about just by. You know the examples you have here and the work you've done here. And this. Um, what I typically do is I like getting them young and kind of studying them a little bit to see what they like. Now, granted, we know the tree monitor is going to climb. You know, black throat is going to be more you know on the ground. But also within those, they're going to have different traits. And I think we can really get a good understanding of studying the animal, that specific animal, for what it is that they like to do in that grow out enclosure. So as it's in a grow out enclosure, I'm also daydreaming, looking at the empty box after I built it. To kind of, I guess, going back to being a kid and doing like that imagination, right? You're seeing what can come next and what, what is it not only that I want to see the animal doing, but what is the animal going to enjoy doing so it doesn't get bored being inside of an enclosure. So right now, you know, I'm working on the Burton's build, which is kind of laying out my larger ledges first, trying to get an idea for surface area to triple the size of the enclosure. Because, you know, you can have a 12 foot tall enclosure, but if you don't have anything on the walls or branches, what's the point, you know? So really just not jumping the gun too quick and going at it, but really kind of taking my time, pulling myself back, because sometimes that's when the good ideas really come in. How do you like uh, working with the zoo boxes? I love it. It's a game changer. <clears throat> um, I've used dry lock up to this point, but when I got the coming eye, that wasn't good. That would have lasted a day and a half if, if we were lucky. Part of that would have been him sleeping. The uh, the zoo box, I mean, as you say, it's light as a feather, but you can knock somebody out. You can literally yeah. club somebody with it and mess them up. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's resilient. Um, easy to work with, easy to texture, and again, I always say this, that if you could see it in your mind's eye, with Zoopoxy, you can do it. You have plenty of time to work with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, if you texture up a wall, and you say, ah, it ain't heavy enough, you go back in there and get it exactly how you want. If you go too heavy, you can literally take a wet glove, smooth it out, start all over again. Once it cures, you better have done a good job because it, <laughs> once it's cured, it's done. The monitor ain't scratching it, you ain't scratching it. Yep. Um, but in regards to the, so the reason I started with Zupoxy is when I got the Mertens, I wanted, it started out like this. I wanted to line my tub because it was black. I wanted to line it with something so you could see the Mertens in there. And of course, started the tub. I told my wife, oh, that's all I'm gonna do with the tub. You know, and then the next thing I know, I'm doing the walls and this and that. And she was yelling at me the whole time saying, you should have bought the 10 gallon kit. So needless to say, on that first build using Zupoxy, I went through seven gallon kits okay. and I should have just bought the 10 gallon <laughs> kit, right? Yep. Are you trying to, how big are you making your Merton's cage? Eight by four by just under six. So. Okay. Yeah. Big pool, same kind of, kind of concept. Pretty much what, what Mike, it's going to be, I'm, I'm following his blueprints for my Murphy's Bill. Actually, yeah. yeah, I'm excited. It's a lot of, of Zupoxy. Yeah. yeah, it is a lot of Zupoxy. And you know, one thing I found with working with Zupoxy, of course, they're a company, they're in business, and they have a suggestion, thickness that you put it on. 
And I started putting on it their thickness in, and I'm like, there's another two gallon kit. There's another two gallon kit. So I started learning to um, make pancakes with my hand, and then with gloved, wet hands, you kind of push these uh, these pancakes around, and when you, for the way I do it, when you do this, you get a ridge, so you get a real low spot, and then you get a high ridge, a, a low spot under your finger, and a high spot, obviously. So when you take that, and you just keep moving your, your you keep moving from the low spot to the high spot, you're basically spreading it thinner and thinner and thinner. Of course, there's certain spots that you want it a little thicker, yeah. and then there's other spots that you can get away with it being a little thinner. Spread it a little bit more. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and again, with with all of this being said, uh, to, to just see you taking it to the level that you're taking it to, uh, you know, some guys would be, like, jealous. And I am jealous, don't get me wrong. But to see something that I've loved since I was a little boy, really being taken to the next level because I'm going to tell you something you're going to get big you're going to get huge with your builds because you're so precise you explain it so well and um, nobody is going to buy a Mertens monitor and put it in the box anymore they're going to buy them and they're going to want to deck these enclosures out as far as cutting glass windows into these plastic tubs it's just Zupoxy is definitely a game changer and uh, man, to see what you're doing with it is, is just awesome work. Yeah. And uh, so, let's talk a little bit about your little surprise guy, your little guy. Yeah, and so, got a Borneo earless monitor. Just an amazing species. I'm super excited to have them. You gotta get whatever this ends up being, whether it's a male or female, you gotta get the opposite so we can start a little project. That sounds so, good. Yeah, but one of the coolest, one dream animal for sure. But one of the coolest animals that I've ever had the honor of taking care of, and dude, they're little savage eaters. This thing will put down a night crawler, no problem. You got only support, man. Maybe, I don't know, um, five or six inches right now. Um, if that. You go ahead. Come on in. And, um, yeah, you know, they're, from what I understand, pretty easy to take care of. And I have experienced that, you know, myself. As long as you have the water temperatures right, you know, uh, the water, a nice little place for them to kind of be in shallow water. I do have the Alasa heater in there, mm -hmm. and that thing dials in the temperature perfect. He is in the grow out right now, just until it gets a little bit bigger. And of course, your grow out ain't just a grow out. He's got <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful grow out, so yeah. kudos to you on that. And again, while we're on the, the conversation of uh, Borneo earless, that was such a mystery animal coming up and now they're pretty readily available and you know guys like brad are doing real well with them keith mcpeak we're kind of cracking the code with them i believe we could breed them without much issue at all we kind of know how they want to live nest which is the challenge because they live in a real wet environment however their eggs can't be too wet so you got to figure out that and uh and I can only imagine how your adult closure for that is going to be tiered out for the dryness and what they need. And now that we got now that we got Brian back, uh, we were talking about Brad's Borneo earless. And now that I got Brian back, I want him to say how it was in the days of knowing him from a picture. Yeah, you you're lucky if you've seen you know like. More than one picture of them, let alone two that were not, you know, from that same expedition. It was like the same animal that had, you know, a different profile picture of it. So, you know, they've always been a rarity in, uh, in captivity. Personally, I, I've i seen them in person in like Tinley. Um, they're a cool animal, but they just. It was an enigma for a long, long time, and it yeah. seems to be going the opposite direction now. And I always liked them, I shouldn't say I always liked them, from the pictures and stuff, we really knew nothing. We knew they were yeah. from a really wet, soggy habitat. And um, now that we know how they are, and the voracious feeders, like Brad had said, that uh, a term I'd like to coin on them, 
is a, a bulldog salamander. Because <laughs> can you explain it any better than that? One hundred percent. There you That's go. What they are a yep. bulldog salamander. So yep. it's a badass little animal for sure. And you you finally got you one and. Uh, can't wait to see what you do with it. Yep. Thanks for helping me locate them too. So. Yeah, yeah, no problem. That's what we do. We help each other out. Um, so, okay, we talked a little bit about the Mertens. So, let's walk through your uh, coming out project. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a fun one. Um, it's an eight by four by just over five and a half tall. Uh, I went through just about twenty gallons of zoopoxy with that one. Yeah, yeah, so it, it, one, it took time, two, you know, I was able to get a little bit of a discount working with them, so that was cool. Uh, one, once again, Plus you're smooth, man, I wouldn't expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the pocket door I made on it was probably cool. one of my favorite features, because I'm able to open up pretty much the whole enclosure in the front. Oh, nice. Right? Yeah, so it, it slides right into a pocket door. So I, I just think outside of the Mike's Monitor socializing caging system, Having that whole open door, because I can't really get inside of it from security all that. So, I mean, the whole thing opens up. So I'm really able to interact and be part of his environment while kind of being on the outside of the enclosure. And that makes so no barrier to your part of, you know, outside of the enclosure makes that transfer a lot easier. Yeah. And so let me ask you, that pocket door, obviously, a six foot piece of glass ain't going into a, is it two pieces? Yeah. It's two pieces. So. Yeah, so it's two. The pocket itself is about three foot six inches. So then the other pieces, I believe, whatever it breaks down to, right. so where it all slides right in. Right. So that's a great, great idea. Beautiful. Yeah. This, folks, is a perfect reason why, if you're going to keep these damn things, invest in tools and know how to use those tools. <laughs> Funny story. 100%. Funny story. Brad comes to my house. He sees all my enclosures. He's blown away. Blah blah blah. He goes and starts building his stuff, right? And this guy is so meticulous and orderly. He sends me a video. All his tools, like a surgeon. All his tools laid out on two saw horses, and I'm like, "Oh, Brad, what are you doing with all that stuff?" He goes, "I'm gonna build a cage." I'm like, "Oh shit! I use a screw gun and a skill saw. That's it." But Man, you're absolutely correct, Brian. Get you some tools, because the tools make this shit so easy. Yeah. And there's certain applications where it's like, if you're going to keep a bunch of them, or, you know, you're ever changing with your cages, it's, it's valuable. It's stuff that you just, you know, you might not think about it, but then it's like, you know, yeah, I do have that. Yeah. I think you got to fix the gutter at the house. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good way to get them in the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't tell my wife that if she's watching. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things, like with the YouTube channel and that whole series I did on the coming out of culture, is I didn't see a lot of like step-by-step -step tutorials for your average rope trying to build something for them lizards, right? So you have all these people worldwide that are getting these huge lizards, but if they don't have the means or the knowledge on how to build something, yeah. then all the animals suffer. So that's one of my main focal points for doing step-by-step -step tutorials. So your average Joe can just watch a video, build something for their animal, and put that house yep. and, and, and really, the way you lay out your videos is, is just, it's so professional, and, and I'm so grateful for you. I mean, me and Brian, we've been doing this. We're not techies. And yeah, I'd destroy it. I mean, it'd be like right, we, we, out of focus and like and a bunch time, of swearing. And one time I thought I was recording, I was like, I thought I was all proud of myself. I went to check the video. I click it, and then it was on. It was, on. It was off the whole time. So to have you out here doing it, and that's what I'm saying. Uh, there's no, there's no competition. I don't know if it's my age. I'm mean, probably because as a kid I would be a little jealous and step up my game. So to see you taking this over, the way you're doing it, and you're explaining like ideas that Brian and I have been doing and been working for years. And to see you put it out there in layman's terms for just the average Joe, be it a small enclosure, a big enclosure, um, you're, you're an asset, man. And, and we appreciate you and uh, all that you do for the community. And anybody who's interested, you, and this is not even a suggestion, this is a, I'm telling you, go to Brad's Bioactive Builds on YouTube, sign up, like, and subscribe, and Patreon, whatever all that stuff is, and... Uh, 
and you, you will you'll thank Uncle Mike for that for sure. So um, again, we thank you very much for taking the time out and like, speaking on your craft. And, uh, and attending Monitor Fest. Attending Monitor Fest. And do you have anything to say about USR? I'd like to, uh, yeah, USR, USR support them. Yep. Do it 100%, right? They fight for our rights, and if we want to keep moving forward and have, not have things pushed against us, go ahead and support USR. <coughs> and in regards to like Monitor Fest, being here, thank you for putting it on. Mike, thank you for co-hosting, doing all that kind of stuff. And if you're interested or have thought about coming, definitely do it because the knowledge that sits around this, this this yard is invaluable, right? Like it is just so much you're learning. I'm learning so much. Hundreds of years. Yeah. Between yeah. guys have been, you know, like two dinosaurs like me, and then you got other people like Daraka, another guy that, you know, been around a long time to breed monitors left and right. On top of all the other stuff he's kept and bred. Um, but you know, he's quite guy. A couple guys that are gonna be talking here next. And, and they're newcomers. And I just wanna say uh, like Brian said, these hun uh, hundred years plus of uh, now, experience, experience and knowledge. You know, Brian and I, when we were coming up, we looked at guys like Mark Bayless and uh, Spracklin, uh, Daniel Bennett, Horn. Yeah, Horn. You know, you went out and you went to Germany and visited them guys. Right. So this, this guy here is he's a he's a pioneer in this stuff for sure. And uh, yeah, so. To see it all coming full circle like this and being passed down to another generation who is killing it and he's inspiring in a way that two old guys like us ain't going to inspire. And he's the man for doing that and that's where we sit today with this stuff. And, you know, the sky's the limit, really. A lot of great stuff has happened this year yep. uh, in the Varanid world. So, uh, again... Thank you for coming out. Thank yeah. you for being a good bro. Yeah, thank you, Brent. Of course. And uh, keep up doing your good work. And yeah. Thank you very much, my man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yep. Appreciate it. Okay. Who are you looking right. for? We're going to do Cody next. All right. We'll do Cody. <coughs> Cody Cap. Cody Cap, come and take a seat. Yo. What's happening, my man? Not much. Oh, Brian is here. Take me all back and beat me early. <laughs> <laughs> came out here early. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Here we are, Monitor Fest 3, 2024. Brian Waterloo and myself. We got Cody Cop here, who's absolutely killing the game with tree monitors. He does tree monitors. He does very nice naturalistic enclosures, cork bark, 3D printing. I mean, you're a jack of all trades. So, talk a little bit about what you do. Yeah, man. I mean, you kind of nailed it on the head. I'm getting more into the cork bark stuff now, um, but I have. Blues, blacks, greens, and cordensis for the tree monitors. Um, my blue tree is actually gravid right now, possibly laying eggs in the next two days. Hopefully, can wait till tomorrow <laughs> so I can get home. <laughs> um, but yeah, my I breed greens regularly. She's usually laying eggs every 90 days. Um, but I do 3D printing. I make stuff uh, like cup holders and the perches that you got. I have a couple in there right now. Oh, do you really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, but then, like the perches that Mike put in with his uh, emerald babies, um, just stuff like that on the side. And then I'm trying to get more into the like the wholesale side of stuff. I my main focus right now is like the tree monitors are just like I have a schedule. I do the things. I have so much extra time. I'm just trying to figure out a way to fill that space. And one of the things that I'm finding I really enjoy is uh, helping people make nice looking enclosures. And so I'm trying to get into the, the cork part and the, like the cork tiles, and I'm going to start doing like sphagnum mosses and grapevine and all that stuff. So I want to help people make good looking setups because looking at an empty box is boring. Oh, it's boring as yeah. shit. It doesn't hold your interest. It doesn't hold outside. And think of your monitors in the lowest common denominator type enclosure day in and day out with nothing to look at. I mean, we all know. They know it's, you know, especially <laughs> wild-caught animals. The captive board is becoming more and more, right. but we know they know the light bulb ain't the sun. Right. The, the cork wall is, you know. But if we can get it closer to nature, at least, maybe it, maybe it helps them feel more comfortable. Maybe it doesn't. Or they, but they use it in a familiar way as yeah. they would the side of a tree, you know, a, a cage with a cork bark wall. Ex exactly. And then they're not, like, I noticed with the tree monitors specifically a lot, like, if the walls are bare... If, if you scare them in any way and they hit that wall and their claws slide on it, they freak out. Yeah. Just it, it adds so much more confidence to the animal being able to climb on everything. 
Um, but then like, like even grow lights, I started adding like really nice grow lights to all of my enclosures. Their per their like level of active has gone way up. They bask under the grow light and everything like that. Full spectrum Notice. lighting. So oh, you're yeah. talking about full spectrum offers no heat. Oh uh, yeah, no heat. No heat. It's, so it's, they're it's going there for bar. something. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that full spectrum lighting and like they're more active when that's on. They they lay right under it. Everyone, I have them in with the babies and the adults. They all lay under. And do you is that a time thing or is it on? 12-12. Uh, or so is it less than your basking? It's le it's a little bit less than the basking, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I like them a lot. Um, I buy them all from uh, Thrive Ecosystems. It's actually a guy in Omaha. I uh, started making them, and they're they're great, dude. They're they're like these slim little mounteable grow lights, and and, and, and this the nose, right? Yeah, yeah, and this little like eighteen inch bar will light up a six foot enclosure. Yeah. Really, I'm freaking nuts. Look yeah, he's great. And that's so, kind of what you're using with the, uh, it's funny, you're a perfect follow-up because we just had Brad and how he does his enclosures, which are amazing. Uh-huh. Like that tree monitor cage that you had at Tilly, that thing was freaking perfect. Yeah, and that, you see how bright that was? Yeah. I had a little 12-inch grow light in that. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. And yeah, and like, the live plants too. I, I'm always harping about live plants now. And like, I hear it from some other breeders, don't even know they could do their thing. But like, it, I, I just hear all the time like, oh, you don't have to do all that. That's not necessary. I know it's not necessary. Right. I do it because I want to do it. So, but, with, with that being said, and me and him being old dogs, me for sure, I don't know too much about Brian, but uh, I am a plant killer. I, I oh, can't, you're the same. <laughs> so, coming up in monitors, and, and Brian will probably agree with me, five plants, Coming up the way we came up, it was it was a no go because they climb on them, they tear them up, they just very, destroy them. They just destroy, they destroy them. them out of time. So we we've always used fake plants for visual barriers and just aesthetics and stuff. But you are actually pretty successful with live plants in your enclosures with tree mount. Yeah. So you talk to us. Um, so I mean, the main thing was, I mean, a better lighting, but then b like it it took me so long to figure it out just because. I couldn't figure out who to ask questions about it. Um, you can't just have eight inches of bedding with these plants. It just doesn't work. And I tried for so long and failed because of that. I do like 16 inches of substrate, even with three monitors. Yeah. They don't. They don't touch it. They like don't climb down on it. But they don't. Uh, they don't dig in it. I throw it um, at Sorry. <laughs> sorry, folks. Hey, what? can you give me another Gatorade, one of you guys? I got you, man. <laughs> I don't care. Jeez, you chugging those things. <laughs> so with, it's good for you. Right. With that, what we're talking about with the with the live plants now, um, what I've noticed with the fake plants is, after a while, you gain experience on their pathways and, and <coughs> certain you know routes they use throughout your enclosure. And we're like in a corner, you would never hang a fake plant in a corner because they try to get up in it, and then in two weeks you're gonna have skeleton of a plant and all the leaves on the floor. Oh, right. So you have to watch placement of your live plants as well? A little bit, yeah. I just try to make sure that there's enough to climb on to where they're not prone to climbing on it. Like, I, I do a lot of horizontal branches Bridges, across. Yeah. 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 So then they're not on the walls on the enclosures. And I think that's definitely, thank you, Brad. Um, something that I gotta redo some lace monitor cages and I do want to try to put live plants in there again. Mm -hmm. um, I had the live plants in with the, the water dragons and my basilisk when they were younger, and the pothos like just took over. And it, oh yeah, it was phenomenal. Um, but like you just touched on, is if you got bigger plants and you're able to redirect their paths. I think I was just talking to Will Exotics about that. Mm -hmm. or maybe it was some other some other monitor people that, that was here, but. That same focus is to try to keep them away from actually physically trying to climb on the plant because they have, you know, you're right. giving, you're giving thick ledge, you're giving around. them an easier way around it. The only problem, though, is like my plants I've had in there with the lace, they just they dig right in. Right. So oh, yeah. I was going to talk about that. Being that you're dealing with a lot of tree monitors, do you suppose uh, peach throats or Coming eye monitors being more of a terrestrial species, 
that like to dig a lot would dig at the base of the plants and maybe kill them, or are these plants tougher than that? Maybe, but I try to make sure they're buried enough. Right. Um, are you I, keeping them in the pot? You're uh, taking it out? Yeah, soil and it's, you know, like I said, it's like 16 inches of soil. Um, the, the two main things, um, A, uh, I'm very selective with the plants that I use. I've gone through a lot of trial and error figuring out what works. Basically, I've settled on, you just want to find something that grows A, well, but then also will replenish leaves if they, because it's bound to get ripped off. Right. It's just, is it going to grow back? Yeah. And if you do like a palm, you're kind of fucked. And, you know, yeah, and, and like it's not going to replace stuff very well. But if you do like pothos and stuff like that, like if, if a stem gets fucked up, it'll grow anyway. Yeah. And, and how about and um, like shiflera and stuff? Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. So we got pothos, shiflera. Uh, money trees are pretty good. Money trees. I do money trees with a lot of them. Um, what's that other one? How about have you have any luck with like any kind of vines? Uh, mainly like viney, like pothos or like philodendron Brazil, which is like. It's, it's like pothos, just different colored leaves. Stuff like that. No actual, like, vining up wall yeah. type stuff. I thought about that with the tree. I, I think they get, the enclosures get too warm for those. I can't keep them wet enough because of the tree. Well, with that being said, in my emerald tree bowl enclosure, I had bought, a friend of mine works in a nursery. Yeah. And they had, like, $10 pothos or $50 pothos. I'm like... Give me two of the fifty dollar pots. Oh my God! You know, oh yeah, the the, the the huge. The pot was this big, and it was just it was taller than me. Yeah. So the one I had the cage ready for, and I put it in there on a shelf in the pot, and the pothos started taking over the enclosure, and would grow up the walls while not a traditional vine. It does shoot roots. Oh yeah. Into the wood of the enclosure. Yeah, and it'll latch in. Yeah, it latches in. Then uh. So, Green tree python I have in that enclosure with all the ant cork. Thank yeah. you, Brian Susan. Um, <laughs> it's starting to vine into that, uh, right. and it was actually an old tree monitor cage. Yeah, pothos. But it's starting to. Yeah, pothos is interesting. I'm still very much like a novice with the plants. I would say at least, but pothos, as far as I know, can do like air or water roots, mm -hmm. and so if you know in an enclosure like that, they can do like air roots. And latch into stuff, and then it'll it'll help maintain the moisture better. But like you yeah, can yeah. even do them straight in the water. Well, I have half of that is in the water. Yeah, That's why that thing blew up. Yeah, oh there. yeah. Well, what I've noticed with my pothos sitting on the ledge and starting to overgrow the cage, going down into the all water bottom, and then I started noticing the same roots like that are creeping up. on the walls are creeping all in the water. I never have to water that plant. No, it gets never. its own water. Exactly. So it's a strong plant and it's a very good plant. Um, you know, the the one other thing I want, well, I guess two things. Um, a, the one of the other hitches with the plants, keeping them alive, misting systems hardly work with plants at all. Because you're going to hit this small patch or this small patch. Yeah. You need even watering. Um, and I used to mist four or five times a day on a misting system. Dude, I turn that off. Now I spray like four gallons at a time with a battery powered backpack sprayer every three days. And because the bedding's so deep, um, it holds so much moisture that it just releases the humidity over a couple days. Um, the last thing I was gonna mention with that is the main reason I'm trying so hard with this is because, you know, being in the Midwest, it gets so dry in the winter. Um, having plants is just going to promote humidity and so if i could figure out how to get the humidity better by keeping plants alive that's just going to help the end so and even if they don't like the plants it's the humidity is about and with that being said from brian and us coming up the way we came up to seeing guys like you and brad really taking this to another level and uh now you really venturing out with these plants in naturalistic setups with live plants, you know, do you guys coming up, and I've known you a long time. Right. I mean, you go back to the King's Name days, and I, and I remember you back then. And, Sorry, uh, I'm the host. Can I? <laughs> and, and it's really, uh, it's, it's really refreshing, coming from my point of view as a naturalistic keeper my whole life, right. to see guys like you and Brad, and you, know, you taking it to another level with the plants, 
with the concern being for the well-being of the animal. Sure, the plant is cool, but if the plant is benefiting the animal, all the more better. So um, right. Yeah, it, it, the way I see it, if I'm, you know, and even if I'm not making a huge margin of a profit on these things, if I'm making any amount of money on these animals, the least I can do is try to improve their lives consistently. Absolutely. And, and, and you doing so and being open with your information, uh, you know, helping the younger people under you coming up. Man, you I, saying I, I'm not young? <laughs> no, you're younger than me. You're younger than me. But to see how no this problem. is all. Thanks. Are you going, Alex? No, he's up next. Oh, okay. Alex is leaving. In, in, grab a bag. I, yeah. Don't forget to grab the goodie bag. Did you show them where they are? I was, um, we were just finishing up with uh, Cody here, and we were talking about how these young guys are not only taking away the naturalistic enclosure, now guys like Cody are stepping it up with live plants. Yes. And, you know, it's a great thing for our industry, our hobby. You know, it's uh, a python guy. Back when uh, the old python forums, I remember, I uh, can't remember his name, but... Um, he was real big with keeping plants with his green trees, and I remember uh, when he'd plant them, he'd put a dead mouse mm-hmm. at the bottom of the roots there, and he's like, "Oh, really?" It would just feed the plant. For the right. Yeah. For the he's like, "I didn't have to touch that thing for like a year." Dude, um, yeah, I I do cleanup crews in mine. I do I do earthworms. I do like I'll even just throw dubias into the bedding and like a bunch of different type of beetles and like. Uh, it's all good for stirring. So stirring. much okay. stuff, yeah, and like, yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I, I appreciate what you're saying, though. Yeah, like, I don't know when I first got into it. I was like, honestly, like I started off in snakes and stuff. I think we and, all have. <clears throat> yeah, and then like, I don't know. I just got, I almost got out of reptiles for a minute because I got so bored. Because I'm like, look at all this stuff in tubs or like these yeah, just plastic and clo- oh, like like PVC enclosures that are just like, you know, like. Uh, newspaper or something. I call uh-huh. it lowest common denominator. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and like, you know, to each their own for sure. Uh, but for me, that just wasn't stimulating. Like, I want to walk in and be like, hey, that looks cool. So does the animal. And it wasn't until, like, I think it was, like, somebody in the UK. I had Where seen some of their, yep. their like, crazy, mm-hmm. like, five by seven foot planted enclosure. And it's like, like in their, that's in their front the room, too. Right? Yeah. And so, I'm, like, me and Brian, we always tried to do the European route back when... What's funny, too, is this fucker, <laughs> back when you are in Streamwood, I, I come into the house, there's just cages in the front room for Stori and, you know, some little Tristus, and I'm like, the one day, he's actually, we're... We're there, and he's just screwing his cage together. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you're going to make this cage. Right there in the front room. Yeah, so, and then notice, front room. We are from Chicago. So right. No, sorry, <laughs> front room. By there. Front room. He picked up a, a shower unit on the side of the road once and made a cage out of it, and that yeah. was like our living room oh, display. Man, that shower the shower unit is great. great for yes. You know, my, my living room is like the size of this room here, and it's wall-to-wall cages. Yeah, you, you bought a house, and I don't think you have furniture, do you? We literally don't have any <laughs> We, so, we have three bedrooms upstairs, and it's like my computer, and a chair, and my drum set, and then the monitors in the living room, monitors in another room, and then my bedroom. So We have a kitchen table. You gotta eat somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got a plant on the table, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's got a pot of those on plant on the table, right? I, I need a couch in the future. I don't have company over anymore, you know? You get a floral it. print, it'll blend yeah. in real nice. Yeah, so, with that being said, um, for Brian and myself, we thank you for always attending. And you know, yeah, Cody's a better. He's a better. Been here every year. He's a big part of our Won't community, and uh, just killing the game with the tree modelers, the three D printing, the live naturalistic planted enclosures, and you know, continuing success. Continuing success, and from uh, guys like us who always look up to the. Europeans with their exactly, natural. yeah. So to see you and other guys taking that rain taking and, up, yeah. it's really refreshing because, like I was saying before, that cancer or whatever, I don't care. Americans were fat. We, we, <laughs> you know, we want, and I don't mean like literally, fat. I'm fat. You know, not you, guys, <laughs> but I'm fat. But we want spoiled. Things, yeah, we want things quick and easy and right. You know what? If, if quick and easy gives you. A PVC enclosure with an upside down 
a flower pot, in a water dish, one little light burning and paper on the bottom. That, that's not what we do. That's not what we do. And it's definitely something that you keep a monitor like that and they're going to make it. It is. Okay. Yeah, dude, every time I come here, I, I'm not getting like. I get like I know I haven't been to your place yet, but every time I come here, like I go home and I'm like I need to, work. I need to, I need to like I'm always working on cages anyway, but like it, it gets a fire going on me. Like I don't, I want to get to your level at some point, and so like it's very inspirational coming out here. Well, your tree monitor cages are definitely. I'm jealous. You fucking awesome. Hey, you know what? And, and like poor old dog. So that's like the word we would use, jealous. There's no jealousy. Right. No, proud. Oh, yeah, We're for sure. proud I get to see what, you know, maybe we had something to do with it. Maybe we didn't. Maybe it was straight all the Europeans, but that's where we took our inspiration from. So to see you in America stepping that up, especially for these animals that are so, these ain't, varanids are not your common denominator, cheap shit enclosure. They want it. They, they'll live like that fine, but... It's not good enough for it's a not monitor. Stimulating. It's not stimulating for us. And we get stimulated by seeing our animals interacting with their enclosure, so why not do the best yeah. we can for the animals? So with that being said, again, every year you're here, is, Brian puts this shindig on, and look, well, you, you had just said something that I'm sure made him his heart flutter because this has been a dream of Brian's for many, many years to see this come together for three years in a row now, and we were just sitting back there and we're thinking, my God, the knowledge in this mm -hmm. place right now, and like you said, you you, you know, you you walk away from this with something. I oh, walk yeah. away with something. Every you're time, never, yeah. You're never gonna learn about, you know, if, if you ever think you know it all, You've done lost the game. Oh yeah. There's always something to learn. Someone below you, someone above you can teach you. Dude, I just found out about a new species of monitor. I really? really fucking heard of. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's some uh it's part of the Greasies or something. It's like oh, yeah, Varanus yeah. spin bulbous or something. And, oh, uh, uh, Will Exotic. Or something yeah. like that. They got all the spikes on it. I'm like, yeah, I saw that on like Facebook like, last month. Yeah, yeah there's there's a lot, man. I mean, when I've when, never, first time hearing about it. Dude, when we came into it, there was Varanus Salvador. That covered about nine different species. <laughs> right, yeah. No, now yeah. they're all being broken up. And I, uh, and now there's 15 types of indicus, right? <laughs> and, and, and judge indicus, right? And all, but yeah. you know what? Here's the thing, though. Really, now that it's coming full circle like this, and we're gaining more knowledge, we're learning the differences. I can remember back when we were kids. This guy called me up on a Friday night. He goes, "What are you doing?" I said, "I don't know. Probably going out with my friends." He goes, well, "You don't want to get together and do some scale counts?" I was like. <laughs> No, but that's where his mind is. Sounds like that's, Alex. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. what this is about, his mind. And bringing all this knowledge together, it's just a beautiful yeah, thing. This is a big hopefully, ten, hopefully within 10 years I can do something like this in my area. Yeah. I, I, I need to buy a house and build something like that first, but and hopefully you though. your cages all over your house. Get the couch, and then you can do it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I got to build one of these and move the cages out there. So, uh, again, I don't really know where you sit on this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So if, if you're not, I hope you lie. But USR. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it. absolutely. Um, I, I'm not as informed as I probably should be. I I, I say that with... You're a supporter. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I know that they are the ones that, you know, read through all the crazy bills, like I heard you talk about earlier, yep. and because they will sneak stuff into bills that have nothing to do with reptiles and try to get stuff passed under the radar, and I'm well aware of that, um, and yeah, they, they protect us a lot on that, for sure. Yep. So, so. No, absolutely. All right, well, again, here we got Cody Cobb, Brian Waterloo, the man of the hour here, uh, Uncle Mike. And we thank you so much for coming and supporting us all the time and doing the work that you do with your 3D printing, your court, your court park, naturalistic enclosures, and of course breeding tree monitors. You're yeah, an man. asset to the community and we appreciate, appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks again for coming. Yeah, yeah dude. All right, Cody. All right, yep. Cody. All right, so next is the famous Alec Nigerian, who I'm not famous. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's the 
the dog fence man. <laughs> He's the guy with the shock collar. The shock collar dog fence. Hey, no, let me clear Forever up. be known. We Forever didn't say shock collar. Shock collar. <laughs> so, nice to see you again this year. You're always here. Pleasure. Um, you know, great young man, and uh, we enjoy having you here. So, uh, take it away. Talk about some of the things you're working with. Or, Brian, you got questions for him? Yeah, Alec is a uh, Californian who ravaged eight hours of air travel to come out here. Um, and I met him, part of the California crew guys, Mason, um, MJ, uh, Matt Rosado, um, and then Alec. Alec actually is a two-time customer of mine and a third customer by way of Matt Rosado, who kept that damn lizard. Um, so Come on, Matt. Come on, Matt. Alec is doing great with uh, with the lace. He just hatched out some beaded. So he's uh, he's putting in the time with the uh, with the heel derma, right? And then uh, he's got a nice collection of old bells and normals. Some of mine. Um, he bought the one held back from me, um, which is stellar looking. And then you know he's got the bells paired up. And we were talking earlier about how he's got his enclosure set up that we're they're basking, they're following the sun. The whole nine yards. We do a lot of stuff outdoors. Yeah. Like, so I don't think away. Mainly, um, mainly just a lot of the adult males and stuff like that. I keep outside. The females, it's a little bit different. You got to be a little bit more careful with them because they are cycling and breeding. Um, I have gone one clutch outside, but um, I missed the clutch by you know like a decent while. So it was just it was a little bit uh, a little bit funky, you know, doing outside a clutch and stuff like that. And, um, I'm not trying to overproduce or anything like that. Like I want, you know, when I keep the females inside, like two to three clutches per year. Um, but with outdoors, like, you know, max, you can probably do two outside with the females, but we're just keeping them indoors. It's just, it's a lot safer, you know, for the females, more control over the temps and stuff like that. But the males, you can keep them outside. Like the goal when I do move out, like probably like end of this year, um, maybe like early next year, I'm going to do like 20 foot enclosures probably for like the big adult males. So and your enclosures are decent size, right? Yeah. Like Which is another thing Yeah, they're that the, my, um, I actually, I just upgraded uh, one of my Argus males. Um, I have 1.1 now. Uh, I did have 2.1, but um, I just up, he's in like an 8 by 12 now. So, you know, he's, he's got like a heated side, he's got a cool side, um, you know, so you can kind of fluctuate you know, between the two. There's like, just like a little hole in between the enclosures. Uh, but the male, the, the some of my adult male bells, like they're in, you know, eight by six by sevens. So, you know, they're pretty large enclosures, but if I were to give them, you know, like maybe like a like an eight by, you know, 10 or eight by 20 or, you know, something like that, you know, especially the height too, you know, yeah. like the height that we'll use it. Like they use it in the closures already. You know, I have a bunch of different ledges, you know, depending on, uh, you know, I have, I have ledges everywhere, you know, some higher up, some, you know, lower than like exactly what he was saying. Like they, they, they figure out, you know, the sun and stuff like that. They you use know? it all the thermal yeah. regulation. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, during certain times yeah. of the day, they're at this part, you know, and, certain and times if, of the day. If you were cognizant of these behaviors, yeah. you could miss a lot. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. by you understanding the animal and how they use the light and everything, yep. you have your ledges uh, strategically placed. Yep. Uh, and again, I want to say something. Another young man here who's talking about six by eight cages, yeah, they're kind of big. Kind of big. That, that's a really nice enclosure, but yeah. to hear you saying what you want to do outside for these animals yeah. is what they really deserve. Yeah. And uh, if you're yeah. blessed to live in an area where you can do these cages like this outside, yeah. uh, and I give you, I want to give you a lot of credit for producing eggs outside where we have very Those, little control. They did go bad, but like, okay, I, it's it is what it is. You know, I probably if I would have collected the clutch on time, they probably would have, you know, gone full term, you know, but... Right, I mean, but again, again I again. know a lot of people who breed, or I shouldn't say breed, who who attempt to breed outdoor enclosures in Florida, and they, they ask me, you know, um, you know, my Mertens are outside, blah, 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 and, and that's great. My Mertens, the ambient air temperature in my Mertens enclosures is, say, 95 degrees, literally. That's yeah. the air temperature in there. Yeah. If you live outside in Florida and a storm came in and for three days 
it was raining and the sun wasn't out, there goes that 95 degrees. I don't care where you live. So you have very little control in outdoor setting. So to do what you've done in an outdoor setting is big. Because I know yeah. some big guys that haven't even got that far in outdoor enclosures. Yeah. And so congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, outdoor enclosures, it's... It's, uh, like, I get questions about it, like, all the time, and, you know, just how do you do it, how do this, you know, how do you handle winter, blah, 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 you know, like, as long as you have a solid heat box where they can achieve that 90, you know, 100 degree, you know, hot spot, you know, um, and, you know, you have to make sure the heat box is big enough to where, like, they can go on one side where maybe it's, you know, in the 80s or something like that, but, you know, one side is, yeah, exactly, within the, within the heat box, but, like, the the plan when I do move like I'm gonna do like heated rooms essentially like Ty Park and stuff like that he does like all the heated rooms and everything um, you know with this new iguana land and yep. stuff like that um, but no they're just that's the plan you know eventually it's 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 a lot of fine tuning you know to like figure it out you know to keep outdoors but once you got it set like it's it's good and like it's you know it's me solid. and Brian here in the Midwest. Outdoor keeping, harder, yeah. outdoor keeping is out. However, yeah. like Brian's got the beautiful outbuilding, and what dream of mine has always been, but I'm a, I'm a basement guy. I keep everything in my basement, so yeah. it's a little harder for me. I have figured out a way to do it. I have not implemented it yet for the summer months, but it's really nice if you had a pass-through that would go to basically what I would call just a sunny cage, where they can get out in this beautiful weather, yeah. sun, birds, yeah bugs, you know, and I'm not saying eat, but just to experience real nature. Um, unfortunately for guys like me and Brian, it's a very limited time that we can open up the door and let them access to the sunning cages. But uh, do you notice, not to interrupt, no, sorry, um, their behavior changes. Are they different? I noticed, like, I've had mine outside a couple times, and they're just... They change. They go completely like it's almost like I'm in the wild again. Like they were. So yeah. not like people will have. They're like, oh, you know, does your animal get aggressive outside? You know, any, you know, blah blah blah. There are some animals I have outside, or technically only one, really. Like with my um, my female Argus, which I'm gonna move inside um, eventually. She's a little bit kind of hit or miss. Like sometimes she's super. You know, sometimes she's, you know, she'll come up to me and whatever, you know, just look at me, check me out. You know, sometimes she's just mean, you know. So and in, in outdoors, outdoors, outdoors. But outdoors. indoors is there, do you notice the difference? Yeah. I think that's what he was Yeah, yeah, I mean, once they're outside it long enough, they get comfortable. Right. They get used to it. Okay. So I wonder how much of that do you think could be the outside stimulus, like, you know, and I've just heard, a, I mean, even the sun, change the hair in the sunlight. The sunlight. Yeah. I get all that. Yeah. I've also heard, you know, these animals, when they become adults, chances are what's going to attack them is coming from the sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've heard I'm people. How many birds fly on my, not my only life. birds, but yeah. I've also heard. Uh, I think it was Crutchfield was saying his crack monitors outside when an airliner, whatever they are, twenty thousand yeah. feet, way up in the air, they'll come. You can't hear it, yeah. but you can see it, and he'll notice his crack monitors. Turn yeah. their head like this and look up. Yeah. to see what this is up in the air. So there's a lot of dangers coming from the sky, which may have something to do with them being a little differently Well, behaved. you know, it's funny. It, it's something that I always try to tell, you know, guys that are new to monitors is, you know, don't have your hatchlings on cages that are on the floor and be mindful of ceiling fans and shit like that where you, you know, where you have them and they physically are seeing that stuff going around like crazy it'll be uh don't forget ya. your bag um your gift bag yeah get your gift bag in the, in Gigi, the barn there show them where the gift bags are it's near the table the table on the inside sorry folks anyway sorry, folks that's um, how lives go so even um ralph faust he always hammered that home with me. He's like, even if you're, because he would have his animals out. He's got like big Niles, he had black throats and all that. Um, but he would walk through like a, a threshold, you know, from one side of his house to the next. And he noticed like even just walking between the, you know, the doorway, they all freaked out because it's like, again, it's something overhead and, you know, something that they can't, you know, really 
process kind of. Yeah, yeah. process uh, really they, they, in the cave. They do they're... process it. I think that's what yeah. the issue is. They they're wondering, is this a danger? Or is it not killing? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they still are wild animals. Yeah, speaking so of that, like, I, fans, I do like the the most recent um, baby that I got from you. Like there was a point where I was keeping the cage you know, on the ground, and like it was still like fairly new, Ooh. so it wasn't you know tongue beating like super readily, you know. Um, but I did elevate it, and it tongue beating now. It's like you yeah. know it comes out onto my hand and stuff like that. It's just in that elevated position. Yeah, they position. do feel much more Safe. secure if they can get like you were like, saying about putting your enclosures, you know, on a table. It's always best chest yeah. high or yeah. higher. They always prefer to look down. Yeah. As opposed to being looked at. When I'm yeah. moving my, um, like my bell mail, like into the female cage and stuff like that, like I'll put them up above me. Yeah. Like when I'm walking, because, you know, obviously out. one is outdoors, one is indoors, so I gotta move them inside. So I'm like keeping them up like this, you know, like when you have them down right here, he's huffing and puffing, you know, being all angry, and I'm just like, I move him up, and he just stops, and he just like, just starts looking around. He's that's like, fun. Here he's again, like, he's like, wait, that's wait. That's another Rob Faust situation I had. Rob comes out here, um, this was not Monitor Fest, he was just coming out here to visit. And there's a local pet store that was over here and um, they had this Nile who I ended up getting and they named him Doug and he ended up going to Rob. So it was the typical Nile and you know it was real you know aggressive pissing and all that and Rob's like, you know, hey, can I take it out of the cage? <laughs> My buddy Jason Subic, he owned a pet store. He's like, if you're crazy enough to grab it, have at it. So Rob grabs it, and it's, you know, typical Nile, just threatening and, you know, like, wanting to fight. Up and, up. and he just did this. And within a minute, that thing just, oh, no. everything just elevated down back to the calm, and he's like, tongue flicking. Like, like a trick from, like, yeah. in the early. Maybe. Because yeah, like, I remember he's, you know, like, because that's how I kind of learned it. Like, just, you know, keep them elevated, you know, make sure, you know, they're above everything, you know. Because I have dogs and stuff, you know, sometimes I'm moving, you know. It's Part like, you screaming kids. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah. 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 Screaming kids. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My sisters, you know, my mom's like, what are you doing? I didn't know you were moving the lizard now. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't know how long we've been on this live. It's been quite a while. We've had some great interviews. Um, we'll go in and take a look at Brian's beautiful enclosures real quick. Uh, oh, wait, before you do yes. that, Alec had some awesome news about a visit to Yuma. Oh, you tell yeah. me about that? Oh, yeah. So, one other thing besides keeping like, uh, lace monitors, beta lasers, you know, being in the hobby, keeping the breeding, I do a lot of herping and stuff like that. Um, so I go out to Arizona, I've been out to Nevada a few times, only had one, or, I mean, besides seeing dead snakes in Nevada, only had luck one, uh, luck one time there, but Southern California, do a lot of herping, but in Yuma, recently, recently, we, um, I found my first Gila monster, which is, like, a big, like, really big deal, like, it, it was true, it, like, it, like, I, I screamed like a little kid when I saw it, like, just crawling through the wash and stuff like that, I'm, you know, I was, we were with some other buddies, and I'm just, like, me and a friend were just hiking up the canyon, and I'm like, Logan, 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 come here, come here. There's a fucking Gila monster in the middle of the wash, you know? And then it just, like, it just... And, and to see them in their natural yes, habitat. Exactly. And exactly. And, to think, and, and you know what? How does that thing survive out there? Like, the, the area where these Gila monsters, like, um, banded... So there's banded Gila monsters and there's reticulated Gila monsters. The banded ones are, you know, more, like, southern... Um, like southern area you know, or uh, southwestern Arizona, you know, up in Utah and stuff like that, and even the ones that are supposedly in California, those ones are technically um, banded as well. But um, those are honestly, those are the rarer ones as well. And I just never thought my life were, would be, you know, from from that area of Arizona. I was I always thought it would be like, you know, up north, you know, near Tucson or Phoenix or something like that. But seeing one down in Yuma, it's just it's been a dream since. You know, yeah, like when you see that thing and you're like, oh man, I want to take that. Oh, yeah. how does he make it out? Yeah. That's where they're at. No, yeah. I know. It's, it's, no, I get it. But, but, yeah. but, but, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, also, it's yeah. to see that and to think, oh, I could take this home. To really know if you took it home, 
it wouldn't be living its best life. Mm -hmm. That animal is suited for that habitat. How, like, they do live, like, like, that's why they're so rare. It's because they spend, like, almost 90% of their life, like, especially in the year itself, like, in a burrow. Yeah, they're year -round. definitely fossil. They're, they don't, they don't come out. That's why everybody's like, oh, they're so rare. Oh, they're so endangered. They're you know, there. They're there. They're just, you don't see them because you have to go high. at the right it's time. It's too dry. Yeah, exactly. And they're, exactly. they're down where it's nice and uh, humid. And Did you ever have eels? Not yet. I'm working on it. Now that I live in the Get a beaded, man. He's got beaded, beaded, man. I, I know, I, I know, I know. But there's they're something the about those orange eels, man. Yeah. I just, oh, I like them yeah. so much. You should see the beaded. Come on, man. Send me a picture. Oh, send me yeah. some pictures. I will, I will. Send me some pictures. Uh, I got it. We can live Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some sulfurs yeah. here. Yeah. Some yeah. emeralds. Yeah. 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 So, so check this out. So here we are. We're, we're live here at Monitor Fest 3 2024. Brian Waterloo's place. This is just the fucking best. We got this guy, Alec. He's here every time. And I couldn't help but notice you're wearing a U.S. Arc shirt. Oh, Please yeah. say something about U.S. Oh, Arc. Man. They're, the fight, they're fighting for our rights, you know? Like, uh, I keep three ticks. You know, they, at one point they were banned. You couldn't ship them across the entire United States. You know, um, they do a lot for us. They, you know, they support us, you know. If it wasn't for them, you know, we'd probably be screwed. Yep. Like, to be completely honest, like, if it wasn't for them, we would be screwed. And it, you know? These times... And it takes, it takes a lot to bring a group of people together, you know, and stuff like that. So you just... The fact that they can bring, you know, everybody together, everybody fight for, you know, one reason, you know, that takes a lot. Well, it takes a lot. from uh, Brian and myself, yeah. you're a fine young man, yeah. and I really appreciate knowing you. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for always coming and supporting, and uh, so we've been on this live for quite a while from Brian's place here, Monitor Fest 3, 2024, and uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up now. Um, uh, you got something to say, Brian? Uh, I don't know if you want to, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to go around and interact with, everyone, talk with some people, and I'm going to show Brian's cages off because they're absolutely gorgeous. The hard work he puts into it is definitely, you know, worth showcasing. Uh, same with, you know, the For food. The indoor doors. guy, this guy does the cages <laughs> right. This Absolutely. guy does, this guy too. This, you know. Well, we like come indoor, from the same school. For, me, yeah. yeah, for indoor, it's fucking incredible. Like the cages. It's so, incredible. I don't mean to cut you off. I don't know how long the live has been. How long? You don't know? All right, well, we're going to go see. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah thank you, sir, <laughs> for holding the phone. Um... We're going to go in and look around the cages, talk to some people on why they like coming to Monitor Fest. And uh, again, Brian Waterloo's place, Monitor Fest. Try 20. to make it next time. Yep, try to make it next time. It's only going to get on, bigger Mason, and better. Logan, Parker, all of them. All I, got of so, them. I got so many names. You got to come. Kai, you gotta come. Kai, who's, Kai, come on, Kai. You got to come, come on, Kai. Man. Alan Stevens, you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, come yeah. Even MJ. Come on, man. MJ, come on, yeah. yeah, yeah MJ's supposed on, to come. He's supposed to come next come year. Come on. I think he's going to bring his deck. Are you guys leaving? Yeah. Nice seeing oh, you really? guys. Hey, let real quick, turn around to Lucas and Caitlin. Hey, why do you guys like coming to Monitor Fest? It's simple. The people. Camaraderie. Yep. Yeah, the people are awesome. Get to talk to people from all over the place that we only get to see a couple times a year. Except for you, Mike. We see you every week. Yeah. But, and we get I mean, to nerd out on things that we all have. I'm done. the cricket plug. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I get, I get to sit there with my hands on the glass looking at a lizard. And I got to get excited. Clean grease off the glass and when your, you go home. And your wife feeds us. It's wonderful. It is. All right, well, thank you guys for coming to Monitor Fest. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks again. And our wonderful host. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you These are more vets. They've been here throughout the years. Thank Appreciate you it. Thank you. Are thank you boxed you in or you guys are good? Yeah. I can sneak out. Bye, Caitlin. Thank you. Love you. Uh, yeah. Take care. Sorry about the author. It. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got four people here. Wow. All right. So, yeah. Turn it around. All right. Here it is. We're back at Monitor Fest. All right. We're gonna go take a tour inside, and we're gonna talk to some people. Yep. Say hello. Yep. Let's go. Uh, let's turn this around real quick. Kayla. Hi. Serenity Dragons. First time Monitor Fest person. Super pumped. What do you think? <laughs> what? How do you like it? Being able to wander through Brian's stuff was absolutely fantastic. I've got a couple new scars to take home from his iguana, so that'll be that'll be a lot of fun later on. 
Hey, getting to meet everybody. Everyone's yeah, fantastic. Everybody's been so nice. Are you coming back? Oh, hell yeah, we're coming back. That's all I wanted it's to hear. It's honeymoon. What you talking about? Yeah, yeah that's right. This. Happy, uh, what do you say? Someone gets congratulations on your marriage. There you Appreciate go. Appreciate it. And <laughs> here you go. This is uh, Brian's wife. Yes, I know what you're all thinking. What is she doing with a guy like that? I ask him all the time. I ask her all the time. But here's his property. I mean, just look at this piece of property. We got the pond, the beautiful house, the beautiful wife. Real good. I didn't want I was like, next time now. We're going to go look at some animals now. I'll bring a big one because there's a lot of people. Next time I'll get you a small. And here we got. This is Rex Rash. This Rex is my, Rash. My roach guy, up until I got rid of animals that eat roach. <laughs> but I still got him. He what still you, got him. I, and, it, and I get him from him. And this is his first time coming to Monitor Fest. Um, he was here in Tinley with Alex and uh, Christian. So amazing. Up, so much fun. So what do, you, what do you think of uh, Monitor Fest? Oh, so glad I made it. Wish I could have made it sooner. Yep. Very so glad And we're glad to have you. And uh, <laughs> we're going to go in to look at Brian's cages. So here we go, guys. Don't mind me. I'm just gimping yeah. away. Nice seeing you, Rexy boy. Oh, yeah. something to eat? Oh, no, I'm, I'm chowing down tonight. Okay. Nice seeing you, Rexy okay. boy. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Right back at you, man. Uh, look at the dog and the kids. We had a beautiful monitor fest. How can you beat it? So here we go. Let's see who we got here. Who we got here? We got Grant. Esteban, we got Ryan McVeigh from VivTech. Just nope. real quick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You heard him on his all new lighting technology. I know. I mean, just keep asking questions and I, I'm just well, answering them. Here we're, we're we're doing a live. We're doing a walkthrough of Monitor Fest 3 2024. Why do you like Monitor Fest, Ryan? I love Varanids, and I like talking about them with other nerds that love Varanids. So. Yeah, and, and how much knowledge is around this place right now? That's what's awesome. Is That's the thing that people don't get with social media. I appreciate everyone watching this, but you don't get this. You don't get to talk. And these guys right now are asking me incredibly in-depth details or on UVA, UVB, lighting. Um, you can ask guys about how they're breeding their monitors, how they're keeping them, their diets. There's... An enormous you amount walk of knowledge away, here. And you always walk away from a place like this learning something oh, yeah. new. And it might be from a young guy. It might be from an old guy. But the ideas are just, they're here. And this has been Brian's uh, his dream for many, many years since we were young. And to see guys like Ryan here. Esteban, got something to say about Monitor Fest? Yeah, man, I just... All these guys know, so, you know, learn from everybody, from uh, just seeing all these awesome exhibits and everything that Brian has, all these cool nerds like us and everything. So, it's awesome. awesome it is awesome. <laughs> Monitor Fest 2024. What do you, think, Joe? you like it here? Yeah, I like Good time. everybody. Awesome. Uh, I'll come back. Yeah, these are three our, vets, too. These guys yeah, are always here. Third year coming. I mean, yep. So we come from Cincinnati and we've got a lot of monitors ourselves and we really enjoy meeting everybody, learning from all of you guys who have done it for many years and some of us who've only done it for a few years in comparison. Yep, yep. And Grant? Oh, Grant? Uh, honestly, it just it feels like a family when you come here. Everybody mingles and so we show each other all of our phones, all of our pictures, and sharing all of our in-depth ideas. I mean, heck, the first year we got real in-depth on genetics. This year we're in-depth on all the lighting and necessities for that need. Absolutely. So, again, thank you all from Brian for attending Monitor Fest every year. And uh, I'm going to go in here. We're going to look at some cages. And thank you guys for the interview. Thank you guys very much. All right. Here next year. Party hardy, Wayne. Okay, here we are. We're walking into the thing here. And here we got some uh, Adeline Robinson. Yeah, I know. I brought some of my monitors. Some of my emerald tree boa babies. So we're coming in. We got Rich sitting here. Hey, Rich, do me a favor. Say what, something about you. Hold it. Yeah. All right. Say something about U.S. Arc. Oh, my God. U.S. Arc. Everybody's got to be a member of U.S. Arc. So if you haven't, join, join, join. <laughs> Get under as soon as possible. And so. Rich is a longtime herper from the Chicagoland area. A fantastic breeder and every year attendee here. Yeah. And yeah, why do you like coming to Monitor Fest? Well, because we got good company, Mike. Every 
Brian Waterloo, the host, has done a great job. You get to see lace monitors and some really awesome habitats. You get to hang with a lot of really cool people. So come out to Monitor Fest. Absolutely. Can. Thank you, Rich. All right. Then we're going to go around. You can talk to him. Oh, what happened to this guy? Hey, hold that. Uh, you in the witness protection program or what? Come on, say something. I can't look at me. <laughs> say hello, Big hello, Tone. Hello, everybody. How are you? He's a good man. Look at the guy behind the camera. What a great guy. Oh, man. that's my daughter, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> and um, your name? Robert. Hi, Robert. You, are you a monitor guy? I am a monitor guy. And why do you come to Monitor Fest? You see the man, the myth, the legend, Brian Waterloo, <laughs> and the monitor fans that enjoy this fest. Absolutely, and your beautiful wife? Yes. Yeah. There you go. I, I got it. Here's the questions coming in. What is she doing with him? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. How do you like Monitor Fest? Oh, I love it. My first time. I can make it. Absolutely. Got a lot of cool people here. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for coming. Thank you guys for the interview. We're going to go look at some habitats now. These guys over here lying to each other. Let's go. <laughs> so, where do you want to start, Brian? Um, well, let's start with cages that I'm going to demo again. Oh, this guy. This is, this is stuff that doesn't pass his standard. Look at this. He will take a sledgehammer to this before too long. And here we're going to zoom in on that beautiful, 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 beautiful lace monitor. And, and for all you folks at home, this cage is way too small for him. Yep. This is just temporary. But it is a beautiful enclosure. A lot of hard work putting into this thing. Well, and, this is all the universal rock. Yep. And with that being said... Um, Brian, I have to say, he's colorblind. First time I came here and I seen these animals, these lace monitors that he keeps here, I said, my God, look at the blue in the face and the pink in the tail. I can see the blue. I can't see the pink. And he said, there ain't no pink. I said, dude, what are you, colorblind? He goes, yeah, I'm colorblind. So <laughs> that summed it up for me. Thanks. So let's go to the next one, Brian. All right, so this one is a demo. That's a demo. Okay, put it in my truck. We'll demo, I'll demo it at my house. So this cage, for all you guys from last year, might remember. Um, now, just let me back up to give you a little scale of this cage. This is where I had all the gamuts, all the shell fins, the water dragons, and all that. Blood. And it was heavily planted at that time. It was and they, they destroyed it. Yeah. But, um, but look, look at the what? What's the height of this cage? Nine feet. It's points. it's nine feet. These animals are up over your head. They feel totally secure and comfortable like this. Brian's designs are next level, and the interiors are just, I mean, that, that's, you know, this is this is something to be, uh, you know, I mean, dude, this, this.